Many of us have been spoiled by full-color satellite imagery. Did you know that there is no green sensor on the GO satellite? So how do we get this? Well, first of all, I'm going to introduce one of our family friends, Ricky, in upstate New York. This picture was taken several years ago, but I'm going to use Ricky to show how this works. And here you see a true color image, but what if we removed the green channel? Well, that's what we get when we use only red and blue. So how can we get true color if we don't have a green image sensor? The GOES Advanced Baseline Imager does use three sensors. There's the familiar blue at 470 nanometers, and we also use red at 640 nanometers. However, there is a near-infrared channel called the Veggie Channel. Now, if we look at the visible spectrum, we've got the blue wavelength right there. The red wavelength is there, and the veggie channel is way down here in the infrared. Now, what's interesting is the veggie channel is very sensitive to vegetation, and just so happens vegetation is green. So you see where this is going. So that veggie channel is going to serve as a proxy for green. And when we combine all the channels, we get a simulated true color satellite image. That one that I created in the editor is pretty close. That's the actual one. And now maybe you understand a little bit more about how color works on the GO satellite. Well, here in Texas, the sky is looking a little bit different. Still got that usual summertime cumulus, but there's a vast increase in high clouds. And that's probably because the upper level ridge has shifted elsewhere. Anyway, let's take a look at the surface map and see what's happening. A strong Pacific system continues to sweep through the western part of the country. Cold westerly winds raking Montana and the western Dakotas, and temperatures in the 50s. And you go even further to the west, 50s all, pretty much everywhere you look, and then we pick up 40s out there in the high deserts of Oregon. A cool 73 at Vegas. That's colder than anything we have in the southeastern part of the states. And there's a little bear clinic low right there over the Four Corners region, with a cold front extending westward, into central California. The dry line has re-emerged in Texas and Oklahoma. Dew points behind that dry line in the 40s, and out ahead of it, dew points are in the mid-60s. That's not terrifically rich tropical air, but it is fairly high, and it's enough to support some thunderstorm activity along the Gulf Coast. Temperatures in the 80s in that part of the U.S. And then looking in the northeast, we've got this new incursion of cold air. The cold air advection pattern has reestablished itself once again. So it's starting to look like winter already in that respect. Some very cool temperatures. That's certainly jacket weather in New England. And in the north central U.S., we get this wedge of very warm air extending up through Winnipeg and up to the lake region of Manitoba. Checking in on the North Pacific, Alaska, West Canada, because that does have an effect on U.S. weather, and we take weather seriously on this channel. It is stormy out there in the Pacific, occluded front approaching the British Columbia coast, and kind of a heavy area of rain about three or 400 miles west of Seattle. Up in Alaska, some very cool weather, 30s and even a few, that looks like a 16 degree reading out there southeast of Fairbanks. And if we take a look further up in the Bering Sea, a very powerful winter system, not completely snow, but this is some heavy snow back there south of Anadir. And you can see there at 14. I don't know if I have that on there. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, that's they're, they are getting some very cold temperatures and you can see that vast 
very strong cold air advection just pouring out into the Bering Sea. So that's marking a significant change into the cold season. And there's another winter storm right there around Banks Island in the Arctic. And then taking a look at eastern Canada and the Atlantic, not much going on. Kind of a weak but very broad high pressure area marking a vast region of polar air centered in the northern Hudson Bay region around Baffin Island. Not much of that is coming south, but some of it is recirculating around to the west and feeding that weather system in the western Arctic. Checking in on the 300 millibar chart across the U.S., a meridional pattern. So the flow is going significantly south in some areas, significantly north in other areas you can see in the northeastern U.S. It comes back down south. The wind is not very strong. I'm seeing, looks like the maximum is about 105 knots north of Vancouver, and in the northeastern U.S., about 80 knots. The ridge axis located from Mississippi up through Lake Superior and up into the Hudson Bay region, and a trough, and I guess that would be a closed low over Salt Lake, Great Salt Lake there. The trough, major shortwave trough extending down across Las Vegas into San Diego, and that's part of a broad trough further north up in Alberta. And there's another closed low up there near Quebec City and a major shortwave trough extending down through Massachusetts. And looks like another low right there. So we're certainly broken up into a lot of vortices. And looks like another trough right there in Texas that's probably supporting the thunderstorm activity that we're seeing in that region there. And also getting some assistance from the subtropical jet. That's it. Showing up south of Del Rio, coming in from Baja, California. Now, one way we can tell that that's a subtropical jet, not only the typical location where we find it, the anticyclonic curvature, but also take a look at the jets up to the north. And we're going to drop down to 500 millibars up at about 18,000 feet. You're going to notice that the jets up north, they're still there, but the jet down in Mexico kind of disappeared. A subtropical jet tends to be a feature that resides mostly in the upper third of the troposphere. So we're talking about above 400 millibars. So that's one way you can discriminate the subtropical jet. You can also pull up a sounding. And you'll notice that the winds in the mid-levels are kind of light, about 20 to 25 knots. And suddenly they pick up to 55 knots up there above 30,000 feet, above 300 millibars. So you contrast that with the standard polar front jet, go up to Ohio, and you can see that that strong wind extends down into the mid-levels. So even at 20,000 feet or so, we're picking up 50 to 60 knot winds. So let's take a quick look at the changes we're expecting. This is the 500 millibar heights and vorticity. So you probably remember a lot of those features we just talked about. They show up quite well. Even the ridge, you can pick that out. So over the next 24 hours, we're going to see things progress. The ridge ends up in the western Great Lakes. This trough over the Great Salt Lake sinks into New Mexico and Arizona. So that's a cutoff low, the main branch of the polar front jet well up to the north. And it looks like around Saturday that upper level low finally lifts out and connects back up into the prevailing westerlies. There comes another vortex dropping down through the Midwest. And you can see very quickly that ridging gets reestablished over the Rockies. So we're going to see the temperatures warm up quite a bit in this area here in a few days. Another cutoff low tries to break down that trough. And meanwhile, out in the Mississippi River region, 
that cutoff low has a major influence. And then the belt of major prevailing westerlies opens up onto the west coast. So this is starting a stormy pattern, very typical for early October. And look at that, a powerful weather system moving into the western U.S. And some of that will make it into the Great Plains. And finally, it looks like around 250 hours the weekend after this weekend, we've got kind of a smorgasbord of upper-level energy. Very impressive. Man, look at that. Look at that trough dropping down. Major cutoff flow, kind of a split flow pattern. You can see one jet way up to the north and the southern one down in the southern U.S. So that's going to bring some very potent weather to much of the country as we get into the second and third week of October. Checking in at NHC, Hurricane Sam out there, 115 knots, which makes it a low-end Category 4 storm. Central pressure, 945 millibars, and the movement is northwest at 8 knots. Let's check out the projected track. We can see that that's not really going to affect anybody, and it looks like it's even east of Bermuda. And we've also got Tropical Storm Victor moving to the west-northwest at 11. I'm not too sure that that's going to make it into the Caribbean. Typically, when they're this far south, that's at 8 degrees north, they have a tendency to make it into the Caribbean. However, over the past couple of weeks, there's been a lot of strong recurvature of these systems. And you can see the projected track on that. Yeah, that's, that's out of there. We're not going to be dealing with Victor, it appears, at this time. And looking at the five-day tropical outlook, we've got that to monitor, but that's probably going to end up taking a similar track, just going off of day-to-day -day consistency. So we'll, we'll see about that and revisit that on Friday. A quick look at the temperature records for today. These are forecast highs. Not going to see any records broken, but they will be coming close in Minnesota and Iowa. Expecting 85 there at Minneapolis and even 88 at Waterloo, Iowa. And also a hot one in Florida, expecting 91 there north of Orlando. There's where we will find the heat for Thursday. Not very many places. Looks like another warm one in northern Minnesota. Same thing in Florida, but elsewhere around the country, pretty seasonable. And that's how it looks for Friday, the first day of October. No records, really, to speak of. But the heat will continue in Florida, especially as that ridge starts pushing a little closer to that region. And that's all for this edition of Forecast Lab. I did get one message from Neil Robinson saying that Sam looks like it's projected by the GFS to clobber the Maritimes around October 3rd. Let's take a look at that. Now, NHC has been taking that track well south of Newfoundland, kind of like that. Let's roll that forward. There comes Sam heading up towards, well, approaching the Maritimes, but staying well to the south. 970 millibars on that. But there's this interesting thing that happens right here with this other low up to the north, a Fujiwara effect as they revolve around each other. And then you can see they bottom out with this 939 millibar low. That's pretty impressive. That That's the kind of thing back in the old days, 18th century, if they sailed into that, they probably would have completely lost the ship. That's a monster storm. It eventually fills in and moves up towards Iceland by the 8th. So certainly some very active weather going on there in the Atlantic. Anyway, that's all I have for today. We'll see you all back here on Friday. And I hope you all have a great evening. Take care. Bye-bye.